We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report here with Emma Vigland. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Timothy Jost. He's the Emeritus Professor at Washington Lee University Law School. Um, professor, uh, welcome back. I was just mentioning before we got on air, the last time I think we spoke was um, next door, I think it was in the old post office next to the Supreme Court when the major ACA case, I think it was Sabellis, I can't remember exactly who, uh, what the what the uh, the, the specific uh, uh, plaintiff. Uh, there have been or, a number in, of them. <laughs> in, indeed. Uh, and that was the one where um, at the time, we were talking about the idea. One of the elements of the case was talking about the idea that somehow the federal government did not have the ability to expand Medicaid. Uh -huh. And um, just about everyone I spoke to on that day, I think including you, thought it's almost impossible to imagine <laughs> that the court could find that element of uh, of of the law unconstitutional there may be other things that they and of course they did um yes. and uh it is with that in mind that i wanted to start this conversation with you because um i think it has become clearer and clearer that the supreme court is going to do what it wants um yes. it regardless of it, without being tethered to sort of notions of precedent or uh just the law or whatnot um let's talk about this case um it is health and hospital corp versus tell uh Telvesky. Telvesky. what what what's what's uh what are the facts of this case and then and what is that issue yeah, George uh, Tlefsky was an elderly man who was a patient in a nursing home in Indiana. And uh, he was allegedly mistreated by the nursing home. He was over-medicated. He was uh, transferred improperly, discharged improperly. And so uh, he's uh, deceased now, but his estate sued under a statute called 42 U.S.C. 1983. And it's part of the Civil Rights Act of 1871, the Ku Klux Klan Act. And what it basically said is if somebody has their consti federal constitutional or statutory rights um, abridged by a, uh, under color of state law by a state official, they can sue in federal court to redress their rights. And uh, you know, over 50 years ago, the Supreme Court held that Medicaid is a federal statute. People have rights under the federal statute. Actually, then it was uh, the, the eight families with dependent children, but the Social Security Act state federal programs, and that people whose rights were abridged by states and that the states weren't following the federal law could sue in federal court. Um, and so the Supreme Court has taken this case, and one question is, whether nursing home uh, rights under the Medicaid statute are the kind of rights that are enforceable under 1983. But a bigger question the court has taken is whether any rights under federal spending programs. Medicaid in particular covers almost 90 million people, uh, but also uh, nutrition programs, housing programs, uh, and the question is whether any beneficiaries of those programs have the right to go into federal court when states violate um, federal requirements. And okay. um, it's scary. <laughs> it, well, it, it, it certainly is. And this is just, you know, um, we have been talking on this program for, for really for years about how um, this court, both when it was sort of a hypothetical court, uh, you know, a 6-3 uh, court, and once it became a 6-3 court, was coming for the administrative state. And this is um, uh, one of those things that I had never um, uh, contemplated. So we have a law in, that is passed during Reconstruction that yes. essentially says, and the reason why it's the KKK law at that time, or part of it was, uh, because there were elements uh there were certain states who had a history of having a problem with the federal government coming in and trying to protect uh individuals there now so and so the that that section 1983 is a sort of like um 
is almost like a, a a machine that facilitates the rest of the machinery in some way. Yes. Yeah. And and, and, and w- could you just also reiterate for folks, because I don't know if most people sort of realize this. The federal government can create rights. Uh, not all one. You know, you have constitutional rights, but the federal government creates rights in citizens by passing laws. Can you just uh, like give a brief explanation? And and so because I don't know if most people sort of realize that. Yeah, well, I mean, the supremacy clause of the Constitution says that federal law is superior to state law uh, when Congress passes a law that it has constitutional authority to pass. And one of the provisions of the Constitution says that the federal government can spend money for the public welfare. And since, uh, well, at least since the New Deal, since 1935, we've had um, programs that have been set up under the Social Security Act to uh, give states money uh, to provide uh, benefits for people but the states that accept that money have to agree to comply with federal law. And so, for example, the federal law says that a Medicaid, state Medicaid program has to determine eligibility for everybody who applies and has to determine it promptly. States also have to provide certain benefits under their Medicaid program. And when states don't do that, The federal government has the authority to cut off their funding. Well, that helps nobody. Uh, But since uh, the uh, uh, 1960s and 70s, the Supreme Court has held people can just go into the federal court under 1983 and sue to protect those rights. And that's what's at stake now. And one of the other uses, my understanding, is that it is a preemptive infringement of those rights as well. Right. I mean, that that's uh, can you can you talk about that element, which is so important? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, if the state says that it's going to stop providing um, dental care for children, for example, there was a case like that. People can go into court and get an injunction to keep the state from doing that. The federal government, again, has uh, the capacity to uh, uh, sanction the states, but basically their power is limited to saying, "Okay, we're not going to give you any money uh, for that part of the program. And then again, that's a, a kind of useless remedy. So it's very important. I mean, if people are going to have rights under these federal state programs, it's going they're going to have to be enforced through the courts. Um, how did, how would you see, you said there was basically two questions that are being addressed in this case. The first is the specific question of whether 1983 applies to Medicaid. Right. The second is whether 1983 applies to anything, (laughs) right? I mean, uh, well, Well, it's no, not, that's not quite right. Uh, the first question is whether, 1983 protects specifically the rights of nursing home residents, because in 1987, Congress passed the Nursing Home Reform Act, and it said you can't, you know, over medicate people, you can't transfer people without going through certain processes, et cetera. So the one question is, can those rights be enforced in federal court? The broader question is, can any rights under federal spending programs be enforced? This is still would not deal with other kinds of 1983 cases uh, for abridgment of constitutional rights or other kinds of federal rights. But basically what they're arguing, and, and it's, it's, it's an argument that just to state almost sounds silly, but what they're saying is that federal spending programs are contracts between the states and the federal government. And in 1871, when the the 1983 was passed, it was not possible under the common law for beneficiaries of contracts that they weren't a party to, third party beneficiaries, to enforce their rights uh, in court. And number one, that's not true. Uh, There have been about two dozen amicus briefs filed in this case last week, and one of them was by 19th century contract law scholars. And they said, in fact, in 
1870s, the law was the opposite. Third party beneficiaries could sue to enforce the rights. But secondly, I mean, that's the last thing Congress could have been thinking about when they passed the Ku Klux Klan Act. Can, con you know, can third party beneficiaries. So just to state the argument shows how silly it is. But four justices have pretty much said they, th they like this theory in earlier cases. So uh, we're going to have to see whether they wake up or whether we can find a fifth justice here. And fourth and fifth justice, I should say. As we address that question, too, is is it is it the case that it really is a contract between uh, states and the federal government if the federal government statutes supersede the state's uh, law? Yeah, I mean, that in in one of the cases, one of the justices said it's like a contract. Well, it's like a contract, but it's not a contract. Uh, because it's binding federal law. And so uh, they have to abide. I mean, they have, have to abide by the law. And the law is, in fact, I guess, incorporated into a contract. States agree, but it's still the law. And it still is, according to the Supreme Court and according to Congress, enforceable um, uh, by Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, how did that second question get into the case? Like, I mean, is that question, is that second question, is it, is it one of those things where uh, lawyers say, well, we don't believe that in this instance, uh, 1983 uh, works relative to the um, to the statute that Congress passed about nursing homes. But in the event that you find that it does we have a second sort of fallback position. Is that what was the way that this was introduced? Or is this another situation where it's possible that the Supreme Court is going to go, you know, when we look at like um, uh, the Dobbs case, they they went further than they needed to, right? I mean, yeah. uh, John Roberts, uh, further than they needed to just to resolve the case in front of yeah. them. Yeah. Um, is that dynamic happening here? Or was that introduced later, the 1983 applying to any uh benef you know uh, the the concept of contract as opposed to like federal law it's just federal law which trumps state law well i i think i would state it a little differently the original question here i mean the main question they're saying is uh you can't sue under 1983 for any rights under the spending clause but if you can then you can't sue specifically for nursing home rights okay so they're they're raising the bigger question um, and um, one thing that's interesting about the case is it's not exactly clear how this case got to the Supreme Court, because this is a county nursing home. Talking Points Memo has had several articles about this now. This is a county nursing home, and there's no uh, in Indianapolis, and there's no record of anybody ever having authorized them to go to the Supreme Court. But there's a lot of steam behind this from. Uh, Republican attorneys general, they filed a brief um, from, uh, you know, from other conservative states, some right wing organizations. Um, so it, it I mean, they are really chomping at the bit to get this issue before the Supreme Court. Well, this is the perfect uh, way for them to undercut programs uh, like this, because th these are the same states where this would be at issue, where they did not want to take the free money that was uh, offered up to them with Medicaid expansion under Obama. So this allows them to essentially, through making it about a, a, a contract as opposed to federal law, undercut these programs from the ground up and then we can maybe have a f national conversation about privatizing some of these programs for example yeah no that's absolutely right it's a uh, uh and again states and counties have filed briefs in this case to make that point um but there were many briefs filed uh on i think there were four or five briefs filed on the side of the of the nursing home, but there were about three, two dozen filed on behalf of uh, Mr. Tulevsky. Um, also, the United States Solicitor Joint General filed a brief in this case, 
And they kind of uh, split the baby on this. They said, um, we don't think that nursing home rights are enforceable under 1983, but we do think that uh, Medicaid rights are generally enforceable uh, under various tests that the Supreme Court has put forth in the past. And apparent, apparently, I think the, the uh, United States is going to have an opportunity to be part of the oral argument, and hopefully that will have an influence on the court as to the enforceability under 1983. What is the what is what, when 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 the 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 U.S. Uh, Solicitor General weighs in in that way and says we're going to split the baby here we're going to we're going to basically cut loose the um, the 1983's uh, efficacy under uh, you know in regards to the to the to the nursing homes two thirds of most uh, of uh, of nursing home um, occupants are there because Medicaid is paying for them so right. uh, but but are they are they basically saying like. We've got a 6-3 court. We got to give them something. Well, they don't say that in the brief. <laughs> so. I, well, yes, I, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I'm asking okay. you. Like, I mean, because at this point, right? I mean, you're the Solicitor General. You and 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 you have an awareness of of the way this court is functioning. They can do whatever they want, and this is basically yeah. trying to say, like, here's we're we're suggesting a compromise. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean. Possibly. Um, they certainly have consistently taken the position in earlier cases that uh, the uh, that, ner that Medicaid rights can be enforced under 1983. And there was a brief filed in this case by members of Congress. Um, there was a brief filed by former officials from Health and Human Services and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services supporting the plaintiffs. Um, so I think they're fairly solid on that. Um, and you're right. Uh, mo many, most people in nursing homes in the United States are paid for by Medicaid. And as they get older, if you look at patients with dementia or patients with residents with uh, AIDS or other kinds of serious conditions, the percentage is much higher. Uh, so this is a very serious problem, uh, but I'm hoping at least they save the rest of Medicaid. Is there, uh, I mean, I, I'm just, I guess uh, the, 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 the last question I have for you is if there is no, if they ignore the mechanism that was set up essentially to enforce federal law, um, mm -hmm. where it touches in terms of money, I guess, within the states. Um, it, it, does it begin to undercut the ability of federal law to, I mean, does it, at what point does it, it bump up against the supremacy clause? So in other words, uh, we may get over the next couple of weeks, a, uh, 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 or a month or two months, a marriage equality um, uh, statute that uh to to back up you know the supreme court uh, ruling which we now know those things can ebb and flow uh regardless of whether it was a a pretty established right um or or the they they could pass a um a law providing a a access to abortion uh in all the states at what point does if you don't have the 1983 mechanism uh, to enjoin things, let's say, you know, that involve money, like at what point does the supremacy clause start to get chipped away at? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, yes, that's a problem. Uh, how do you raise issues? You could certainly raise it in a defense if you were prosecuted for something or if uh, the state tried to stop you from doing something. Uh, but it is increasingly a problem how you uh, how you enforce federal rights. And also, I don't know. I mean, the, at, under this court, um, freedom of religion seems to be kind of a get out of free card for anything you want yep. to do, whether yep. it's federal law or state law or whatever. So, I mean, I, it, it, the, as you said, this court does not approve of the administrative state or of much of what the federal government is doing. So I think that is a continual threat. Um, 
with some, I mean, in some situations, I think it's absolutely clear that 1983 would cover, uh, or there might be other federal causes of action. But this court is very reluctant to imply causes of action where they don't otherwise exist, uh, rights to sue. Well, uh, uh, Timothy Jost, Emeritus Professor at Washington Lee uh, University Law School. When is the uh, oral argument? Um, the oral argument is on November 8th. And, and let me say, I am really glad you're calling attention to this case because it's a complete sleeper. Uh, all these briefs were filed on Friday and there was virtually no coverage of them anywhere. Um, and I think one thing we learned from the Affordable Care Act cases is if there is enough noise out there, the Supreme Court might pay attention. But if nobody's paying attention, I think the Supreme Court is even more likely to do whatever it wants. Did so you say I these oral arguments? I'm sorry. Did you say the oral arguments on on November eighth? Yes. That also happens to be the election day. So <laughs> I imagine I imagine there won't be a lot of uh, uh, coverage on that day either yes, of I these think cases. Yes, will be right. And that worries mm -hmm. me. Uh, well, uh, again, uh, Timothy Jose, uh, Emeritus Professor at Washington Lee University Law School, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you.